what architects are trained to do. I think they're not trained enough to talk to people. You know, yeah. Talk to people who aren't architects. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking with Gavin Henderson, Principal Director at Stanton Williams, a 90-person strong practice based in London where this podcast was recorded, which has gained international recognition for its thoughtful and innovative approach to sensitive sites and complex, ambitious projects. Gavin's wide-ranging experience spans all scales, building types, and sectors, from housing to public realm education and life sciences, and it often involves the insertion of cutting-edge facilities and forward-looking buildings within sensitive historic settings. Through these experiences, Gavin has cemented his belief that a deep understanding of the past, i.e. of the processes that have physically shaped our cities, is key to designing successful environments that foster innovation and allow people to come together to share their knowledge, cultures and ideas. Examples of his work include the Sterling Prize winning Sainsbury Laboratory in Cambridge, the Zayed Centre for Research for Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, the Key Worker Housing Project for the University of Cambridge, and the recently completed UCL East Marshgate uh, Education Facilities, a new 35,000 square metre academic building for University College designed to break down disciplinary silos and encourage collaboration between academics, students and the public. We speak a lot about this project today. This diverse portfolio reflects the collaborative and interdisciplinary nature of Stanton Williams' working ethos, in contrast to traditional architectural practices that focus on clearly defined sectors. Stanton Williams have chosen not to specialise in any one area of expertise, allowing the different strands of their work to inform each other and facilitate the cross fertilization of ideas. Now, this is interesting because we talk about this quite a bit in the podcast and what it means to not specialize, but also have a particular kind of specialization with a certain type of client where if you look at the work of Santa Williams, you can start to, to, to see that there is an expertise in dealing with particular types of multi-headed complex clients. Beyond his project work, Gavin is actively involved in the architectural community as a lecturer, critic and member of various panels and committees, including the Society of Antiquaries of London for the Kelms Scott Committee, the NLA Expert Panels, as well as chairing the RBA Regional Awards. So sit back, relax and enjoy Gavin Henderson. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Gavin, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's good to see you today. Absolute pleasure. I give you your patience with my setup this morning here in your wonderful offices near Angel by the Canal. You guys have got a beautiful view. Um, and you have been here as, what's, the, what's your actual title here? Uh, I'm one of the principal directors. So you're um, one of the principal directors. Yeah. You've been here since 1994? That's right. It, it creeps up on you, I'm afraid. It's, uh, so I'm part of the furniture. We were 12 people when we started and we're, we're 90 people now, but still very much continuing the same, the same ethos. Amazing. And how would you describe the, your kind of main responsibilities in the, in the business? Well, we actually have seven directors. Mm -hmm. uh, so six of us are um, leading projects um, and we have one director who's more on the the business development side. Uh, so we're very hands-on on our projects uh, and then we each take different responsibilities on sort of wider practice issues as well. Mm -hmm. And then within that, the four principal directors who have been they're slightly longer than, than the others, but we've all been in the practice for quite a while now, take a, a sort of overview in terms of the creative direction of the practice. So mm -hmm. we not only lead our own projects, but we are, have some involvement with all projects across the, across the office. Amazing. And you've had a, a, quite an extraordinary career. You've been involved in projects like the Sainsbury Laboratories, um, a lot of education projects, the, the Judge Business School and the Zayed Centre. 
Uh, and one of the projects that we're going to be talking about a lot today is the uh, Marshgate uh, development for it's UCL, isn't it? Up in That's right. up in the Olympic Park, which is an amazing location um, and fantastic, fantastic building. Mm. Um, and so how long has that project been going for in the office? Um, well, we won Marshgate in a competition mm-hmm. uh, in 2016, right? Um, and uh, it completed um, in um, about a year ago now, so it's, it's now occupied. Um, but it, it was ongoing for about six years, and of course, right the way through COVID, which brought its own challenges for for everyone. And, and the, you were you were involved in the whole master planning of the area. It was like a um, thirty five thousand square meter master plan for the site, or um, the master plan had taken a lot longer actually. So right. so the master plan was in place uh, when we started. So mm-hmm. we were working within that master plan, um, and I think I mean if just touch on that project it is it is a quite remarkable project in terms of ambition and I think that that's one characteristic of all those projects you just uh, spoke about mm-hmm. but uh, UCL East which is what is being developed in the Olympic Park is the is the biggest uh, single expansion of University College London in its 200 year history um, um, so Marshgate is a it's a thirty five thousand square meter building. So it's substantial. It's there are four thousand students, seven hundred staff base there. But when the whole project is built, it's going to be one hundred and eighty thousand square meters of, of space. Um, but I think the really remarkable thing about it is is not that scale, or the scale is impressive. It's the ambition to have a develop a whole new type of academic building mm-hmm. and, uh, and campus. So Marshgate is a, is really based on the realization that to um, answer the the challenges globally that we have today, uh, the the solutions are not found within the traditional disciplines, but really in the interaction between disciplines, the space between them. So everything is interdisciplinary. Right. It's entirely new programs. Um, a huge challenge to actually try to design that. Okay. How how did you guys end up getting involved in in that project, and how were you selected to to be the, the kind of main architect? Mm. Well, um, it was a limited competition, an international competition of I think about uh, six practices. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there would have been a, a PQQ selection process to get onto that um, shortlist, and then it's. Um, it's what we call um, an, a, an architectural approach competition. We win a lot of our work in competitions, and some of them are full design competitions. Um, we tend to think the the sort of slightly broader approach is a, is a better uh, way of um, selecting an architect because you're selecting a, the architect and, and their ability to think about the issues rather than a particular answer and a particular design. And of mm-hmm. course, no one can really come up competition stage with the answer to such a complex set of um, of issues as, as Marshgate was. So there are written pieces involved with that, but also um, concept ideas. And in fact, it's one of the projects where the concept we had at competition stage has really seen through the whole um, scheme right to completion, actually, because it was a you know very strong idea about how you design a building to, yeah. to foster collaboration, interaction, the things that are at the heart of, of the brief. It's it's very interesting you say you know, a lot of the work that you, you win is through competitions and obviously that's a very, it's a, for some practices it's a quite a high risk strategy. Obviously you guys have got the design pedigree and the chops to be able to deliver mm. but also it does take a lot of resource to be able to enter competitions and so you're on you're on a, a, an existing framework with UCL or the or the campus prior to that. No, we, no, we went on a, a framework. We tend to compete for specific um, projects. But you're right; it is a um, it's both very um, you know competitions are a little bit like research, and they're mm-hmm. they're a fantastic way to explore creativity. Um, in, but they are very resource hungry um, mm-hmm. in terms of a. Of a practice. So um, we try, I think, to balance that with maybe less intensive ways of of winning work as as well. Um, And it's also why I think the the full-on design competitions where people spend huge resources to come up with a perfect solution without actually knowing what the question was in the first place uh, are not the right way to go because Mm -hmm. they're 
encouraging architects to spend more and more time and, and resource when really what you want to do is to uh, develop the design in dialogue with your clients. It's a, it's a collaborative process. Yes, yeah. With um, something like Marshgate, what was the, uh, the, the competition process like for you guys and how do you typically mitigate your, your risk of investment in a competition entry? Or do you have ways of you're entering a competition entry and you know that, well, we're doing, we're going to be doing more competitions and some of these ideas actually can be reused or evolved into the next competition entry. So it's more of a, a kind of ongoing design research endeavor in the practice. I think that's how we'd, we'd like to look at it. It is a, uh, an ongoing piece of research mm-hmm. and the thinking, the thinking uh, evolves and translates. We try not to just simply replicate the ideas from, from one thing to another. Um, I mean, one thing that we do within the practice, and we've, we've talked about it for a, a lot, is you know, do we have a competition team? Uh, that would be a more efficient way of, of doing the competitions. Um, but actually, um, one of the things that I think is interesting about Marshgate is that it's, it's about breaking down silos. And that's what we try to do within the practice. So every time we think about that kind of efficiency, we think, no, that's, that's not the right way to go. What mm. we try to do is to allow different people to move in and out of working on the competition so that it, um, you know, they bring that level of a mental agility and, and thinking to the other projects within the, within the studio. And that's important to us. That, that's, that's quite interesting and, mm. and quite difficult um, culture to, to set up in a, in a practice, particularly yeah. when the kind of commercial demands are, they could easily pull you into just creating a competition team or creating a, an education team and you've got these kinds of silos of, of information. How do you prevent the, the team getting pulled into and, and sticking into one kind of project typology or someone just being involved in competition after competition? I know, I know what that It's a constant like. tension, to be honest, um, because it, when someone's good at something, the, 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 you know, it's obviously uh, the temptation is to just let them continue doing that same thing. But in fact, it's not good for their, their own development. Mm-hmm. And um, um, so we have to try and find the balance. We do have people who, we have a lot of specialist knowledge within the, the practice, and we have people who invest time in, in developing that. But we try not to to have the practice or those individuals defined or, or limited by that, um, mm-hmm. that specialist knowledge. Um, I mean, if I go back to Marshgate, you know, it, that's about breaking down silos. It's about lateral thinking. It's about cross fertilization of, of ideas. Um, so that is what we're constantly trying to do within within the practice. Um, so we don't have sector driven teams. We don't mm-hmm. have a competition team, and we don't have teams that are constantly working with the same director we 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 set up the team on a project by project basis so people learn to work with different people and have you know we all have slightly different conversations and ways of working so it's 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 developing things in the round do do you ever have i'm assuming that you do have kind of performance reviews with team members or kind of career growth conversations Mm. about what kind of projects they want to be moving on to so they have a, a kind of you know, they can they can start to say actually you know what I'd like to be working on this particular project typology or is it more kind of no we want you over here how does how does it work uh, we we obviously do have um, reviews with the staff um, we also have mentoring set up within the um, studio so that that people are able to talk to um, a peer perhaps or, or just you know another member of staff about the issues they they have and, and where they're going with their careers. Mm-hmm. Um, so we always ask people what they want to work on and we try to build on their interests and strengths. Um, equally, obviously, what what is available within the practice or, or what's coming in through the um, supply of new projects doesn't always uh, marry up with that. So there's yeah. there's always that balancing act. Well, in talking, going back to the Marshgate project, mm. once you had won the competition, do you, any idea who, who else you were competing with and what was that? process like did you get to see the other competition entries or was it more a kind of select invitational competition and well as I say there were about half a dozen entries Mm -hmm. I I can't remember who they they all were at this point so um um and we rarely see the other entries actually right um 
it's a bit disappointing, but <laughs> I think clients feel that if you see another entry, you, you might be, you know, somehow influenced by some, something in that, whereas they've clearly selected us for, for our way of thinking. So, so that's not really the, the point. Um, what I, I did see one or two images and, and, you know, some people had gone very much into, um, this is the building, this is what it's going to look like. Right. Um, you know, we, we actually held back from that um, and talked much more about how the building was going to be used, how it was going to support this collaboration mm -hmm. and interaction. Um, and, you know, that obviously worked very well in this instance because that was the key issue for the building. Um, do, do you ever find that you're entering competitions and the client has kind of picked up some ideas from the other competition entries and now is trying to influence the design that you're doing with ideas that they've handpicked from other competition entries or do you find clients are a bit wiser than that? I think they're a bit wiser to that. Um, sometimes we do multiple stage um, competitions where there's a process of, of dialogue with, with the client mm -hmm. and we're a little bit cautious about that because you can sometimes see that the, the client is transferring ideas between teams in the process of, of the dialogue, um, which actually I think is not helpful for um, anyone really. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's a process we're, uh, we're more cautious about, I think. When working with um, large kind of educational institutions, what are some of the specific challenges that you encounter working with this type of client? Um, I'm not sure I'd say it's a, it's a challenge, but the characteristic and, and as a practice, we try not to specialize, but, mm -hmm. but one of the things that characterizes a lot of our projects is they, they're very complex sites very often, mm -hmm. very complex briefs, and they're quite complex client organizations. Right. Um, so um, there's a, um, people talk a lot about co-design now, nowadays, but in fact, a lot of this is, is, has been and always is very much a collaborative process with multiple stakeholders. So something like um, UCL uh, Marshgate, you know, we had a, a central uh, academic group we were dealing with, working with, uh, but we were having meetings with at least a dozen other um, academic groups, all with six or seven different personalities within them. Mm -hmm. And they were engaging much more deeply within all the faculties and specialisms within the U within UCL. So there is this, this great network of, of collaboration and interaction, if you like, just to act that goes into a, a building of that sort. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about it was because everything is a unique course and we were asking academics, you know, what kind of things might you be teaching and researching in seven years time and what kind of spaces might you need for that? And that's a huge ask for academics who are naturally focused on what yeah, they're right. doing next year, yeah. <laughs> next term. Um, and it's a huge ask for the design team. Um, and that's before you get to the fact that by the time you've built the building, mm -hmm. it may be different academics and different programs that go into, into the, the building. So it's really kind of future gazing um, and then trying to, obviously all the academics wanted a unique space to uh, suit their unique program. And it's actually sort of stepping back from that um, and understanding that a lot of the spaces need to be actually quite standard, more flexible, more adaptable to suit multiple programs mm -hmm. because it's not just the programs that are there on day one, it's you, five years later, 10 years later, the building still has to work. So you're not, you're not tailoring a suit for those initial, that initial user. Right. You know, I think it's interesting as architects, we, a lot of us were trained to think you're, you're designing this very bespoke thing. Actually, it's more like designing a baggy jumper. It's something that's got to fit lots of people. Yeah. You know? And there's got to be kind of future-proofing. Future-proofed, long-term, flexible, adaptable um, buildings. Well, th well, this becomes interesting because it actually puts the architect in a very interesting position to be able to, one, facilitate dialogue in a multi-headed mm. institution like that between mm. departments that might not have been talking to each other very well previously or yes. this is the first time that you're kind of bringing them together and also there's a, a strong kind of business agenda or a vision agenda mm. for the institution of like okay mm. well what's where are you actually going yeah and the architect has a very important 
part in that conversation to be able to help create the future and and prompt those sorts of those sorts of questions how how do you as a as a as the architectural team kind of look at the complexity of the client and you know orchestrate these different conversations and this and the vision of the of the project hmm. i mean you're right it's a really really important part of what we do i think it's an underestimated part of of architecture you know architects come out thinking of college thinking they're going to design things they're going to present them to clients mm. and clients are going to say fantastic and and that's it and and actually we find you know, the skills that are really important are obviously the design skills but they're also the communication persuasion sometimes uh, but certainly engagement skills understanding the politics of a, uh, a particular organization and the dynamics of, a, of how a group work. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were talking earlier about the importance of being face to face. I mean, they do say that, you know, only 20% of communication is, is verbal. Mm. Um, you know, so you, you actually need to be able to read the room and, and quite a big room with quite a lot of people in it um, and to sort of pull out the differences and the strands and, and come to some kind of consensus. So that's, that's a really important skill. And it's, it's also a really enjoyable part of the mm -hmm. process. It's, it's, a, it's a journey you're going on with the client. And the exciting thing is that you're not actually sure. You haven't predetermined the end of that journey. Yeah. You're, it's, a, it's a joint exploration to find something that, that hopefully is unexpected and is better than you know, what anyone anticipated um, at so, the beginning. So, so a project like Marshgate, then, that was in the office for the best part of 10 years or so. Um, until it was until it was completed about six years or six about, or seven years. about six seven years mm -hmm. so it, what what kind of turnover do you have with your own team working on a single project is it is it a case of it is a solid team that's pretty much working on it from start to finish or do lots of people kind of you know jump in at, at parts where there's a lot of production work that's mm -hmm. needed how does the, the the actual team ebb and flow and how do you kind of choreograph that mm. well we have um we try to maintain continuity as much as possible right. so there's a core team and i think we're, we're very good at that i mean both within the practice people stay for a, for a long time mm -hmm. but people uh, tend to be happy working on the projects for a long time and being something like marshgate and our other projects they're quite remarkable things so um people are keen to keen to stay on them mm -hmm. um obviously the team then flu fluxes and, and grows when there's you know production information to to be developed uh, but we try to get the key people to um see our, our way through it um and you know that collaboration is at a um a senior level and all the way through the different um levels of experience within the practice. So we often work with more than one director on a project. So right. there's a sort of creative discussion at that level. So I was working you know, very closely with Alan Stanton and Richard Wardle, who two mm -hmm. of our other directors. Um, and then we have um, senior associates who take leadership roles within uh, different aspects of, of the project. And in fact, the project was, we were appointed both for Shell and Core and for Fit Out. Right. As sort of two slightly different but parallel teams, which was an interesting um, discipline and, and way of working. Um, um, and then, you know, we have key individuals um, working within those teams and, and more junior. Um, and, and, it, and its biggest kind of size, what was the team size we're looking at? I'm going to say that I think we might have had 12 people on the so what was the show and core and a similar number on the the fit out um, right um, so, so, tw so 24 yes, in total yeah. uh, the, the, which is Im quite amazing when you think about it because then that's the size of a, a practice in, yes. in itself yeah so when um, so as I think I said you know when I started this was a practice of 12 people mm -hmm. you know one of the reasons you know we wanted to grow larger than that is not because we want to be big or, or particular size but you have to be um, a certain size to be able to deliver projects of that scale mm -hmm. and ambition and we're constantly looking for new and different challenges and part of that is actually the scale of those challenges um, grows um, 
and um, so the practice of about 90 which is what we are mm -hmm. you know we can we can have a couple of projects of that kind of scale um, but we try to break it up with not just different types of projects so the education projects cultural we're doing a lot of life science work you know, more commercial projects as well but also much smaller projects so um, in origins we still, some of our first projects as a practice were in exhibition design right. and we still do um, exhibition designs uh, on you know very selected mm -hmm. exhibitions because they're they're faster they don't have the sort of 10 year turnover uh, people learn from them quickly they're they're but they're addressing all the same set of issues you mm -hmm. know which is sort of how people experience space you know people's movement through space lighting uh, we're choreographing that whole sequence um, so they they remain important to the practice so i think our smallest projects might be worth only you know tens of thousands and our largest project i think at the moment is 500 million pounds mm -hmm. um, so that's a there's Big a great there's a great deal of scale um, and and so I, I guess as well because you know the size of the practice you're you know you're actively involved in in helping people's careers evolve so you take mm. people on from a part one and see them through to becoming architects and mm. and actually leading mm. projects and 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 beyond um it, how how do you um ensure that people are kind of getting the the right experience on on projects and how do you how do you maintain being able to educate and mentor as as well without kind of being you know how do you keep that balance in a practice mm. I mean, it, it is always a, a, a challenge, isn't it? Because it does depend on the projects, mm -hmm. the, the opportunities. Um, so we have to work with with those. Um, you know, we we do have regular discussions with everyone about you know how they how they're progressing. I think the key the key thing is partly the way our our practice works. Um, you, we are the senior staff, the directors are all very hands on, so we all work directly with. Um, Everyone from mm -hmm. you know the the year out students through all all the um, staff um, and we we work in in what we call design sessions. So these are not like senior staff critting what the team is doing. These are hands on. Everyone sitting around a table working on the project together. Um, we work a lot with with physical models. You can see some of them around us, and we do that because they're. You know, they really are the best way of engaging everyone in the design process. Mm -hmm. So we'll be cutting up bits of card together, um, scribbling on paper together. And, you know, ideally, the, you know, the best idea from whoever it is within the team is the idea that kind of gets taken forward. So I, you know, our view and I think the, the feedback we've had is that that itself is a, is a, is a learning process that's... Right. that's um, that's actually quite un unusual and, and you know, perhaps difficult in a, in a mm -hmm. lot of practices to, to achieve. So it's a creative workshop kind of um, environment that we, we try to create. Um, in, in terms of finance in the, in the, in the business, what is the, the culture like of talking about money and profit? And how do you, you know, certainly as the business is, you know, you, you've said when you joined, it was 12 people, mm. now you're 90. A lot of things change and a lot of systems and things that worked at 12 people no longer yes. work, even when you're at 25 people. Yeah. And certainly around the management of, of money. And also, you know, there has to be some kind of balance where, you know, the project needs to hit its profit margins and, you know, that's just being a responsible business person. But there's also the tension of that and the, the desire to want to design and mentor and educate and all the things that we love doing as architects how does how does the stanton williams as a practice balance the the, the tension between finance and creativity or is there one um, i think obviously there there is one because i think left to our own devices you know we would go on being <laughs> creative um, and um you know because i think you, you could always work on something and continue to develop it further, mm -hmm. um, um, but that's you know that's not useful probably for our clients either. They, they, you know, they, 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 it, the 
the financial discipline um, is a, is an important one, and mm-hmm. I think probably actually um, simply working in in the absence of that, if that was possible, it would be you know, it's, a, it's a it's a good discipline mm-hmm. to have to work to. Um, you're right, you know, when you grow from twelve to ninety or beyond. Um, um, in a way, you're trying to replicate the things that worked easily at 12 and work quite fluidly. Um, you know, 12 is quite a good creative team in itself. Yeah. Um, I think they say 6 to 12 is sort of ideal size. So beyond that, you have to start putting more systems in place to try to replicate the sp- strengths of that small team and the mm-hmm. communication of that small team. Um, as you get bigger, you can obviously have people dealing with some of the um, specialisms, though. Um, so I remember uh, you know, quite recently I was talking to um, a well-known architect who had a practice actually of I think it was nine people and she was complaining about how big it had got and it was just as we'd reached 90 <laughs> and we were just talking about how this um, um, how this worked for us but of course and what, what surprised her was that I spent a lot more time on design than she did because if you're in a practice of nine you're having to do the finance, you're having to look for the next work, you're, you're having to look after everyone's careers. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, we have, as we've grown, been able to have people looking after HR, thinking more closely about the financial side. I, of I, I think people forget that actually, that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes large practices are often think, seen um, as less creative. Mm. And actually, a larger practice has a lot more resource to be able to support mm, design absolutely. and and allow people to go very deep and be unfettered by all the other things that you might you know be needing to think about if you're running a small uh, a, a small a small business. Um, in in terms of how you guys have maintained your your culture and a, mm. and a design culture as well, and haven't kind of veered off into becoming overly you know, commercialized in the sense of, you know, the, the, the design quality has been maintained mm. and, and it's a very, very strong identity that Stanton Williams has in the mm. architectural world. How have you kind of held on to that with the challenges of growing into a larger practice? That's not an easy, mm. it's not an easy thing to do. I think it is the, um, the rigor of the, the design process, the design sessions mm-hmm. that, that we have. Um, and the focus on things like model making, which you know, some, some architects have heard people say, we don't need to do that anymore. We've got computers. Well, actually, we're building the physical environment, and and it's still, you know, the closest thing that you can get to understanding that in advance is by building, prototyping, making. We talk a lot through mm-hmm. about, um, yeah, um, thinking through making. You know, the hands on. You, the hand thinks when you make a model or, or do a sketch. So, so we try quite hard to hold on to those core ways of working alongside, obviously, we're using Revit, we're using BIM, we have 3D environments and, and all of that. But they don't, one doesn't replace the other. Mm-hmm. Um, so we work very hard to maintain those kind of core ways of, of working within the practice. But the, um, I think the hands-on involvement of the directors um, is very important. You know, we were never. You know, it's not like um, a pyramidal practice where you've got one person at the top and and their name is uh, across everything. You know, we started off as a dialogue, if you like, between mm-hmm. Alan and Paul, and that's continued as we've grown to the current group of of seven directors. So there's not a there's not a a sort of pinch point of everything going back to one person who occasionally looks at something on your project and says yes or no. It's very much about um, an individual director working on the project with the client and maintaining the level of focus that you would get in a smaller practice, but within mm-hmm. the larger group and then us coming together as directors and a practice to make sure that you know, our culture and ethos is shared across all the projects. Are, are all the directors actively involved in design work and projects or do you have directors who have a specialism say in finance or how, how does the director team work and how are they and what does it take to be a director what are, <laughs> what, what are the what are the kind of core competencies that 
for you you think are important for a director or a partner to have? Um, so we, we do have um, one director, Robert Bird, who looks after the finance and, and management of, mm -hmm. of, of the practice. And that's, that's really important, I think, because the rest of us with the best will in the world can sometimes get distracted into design, which is the core of what we do, of course. Yeah. But it's very good to have someone who is, has the oversight and in response to your, your previous request, question also has you know, a rigorous set of data about project profitability, which, which is shared with the, with the teams um, and across the practice to make sure that we are you know, heading in the right direction um, in that respect. Um, the other, the six of us, the other directors are all hands on in terms of, right. of, of projects and also take on um, other aspects like an oversight of our, our marketing or um, I also meet with Robert every week to discuss the, the project, the practice finances. Um, so there is, it's not entirely anyone's individual responsibility to, to do something, but we, we share that Has it, between us. Was it always that way? Um, or or in the, when the biz practice was smaller, were the directors like having to be more involved in the finance and perhaps the more management of the practice? Or, and how did, how did the, the director or the, the leadership team kind of establish themselves and, and allow you know, the, the, the roles to be uh, split, the business roles be able to be mm. divided up amongst the, all of you? Um, I think when we were about 40, practice of about 40, um, one of our architectural directors, uh, Peter Murray, who's not, not with the practice anymore, he's now, now retired, but he, he was an architect and he, he decided to specialise more in the, in the business um, direction and that was a fantastic thing for the for the practice mm -hmm. because you know he, he had to absolutely grasp the architectural side of things but he he wanted to do all of the you know financial business side of, of things um, and that proved to be a you know a, a really important thing at that point for the practice and that scale for the practice um, so when he retired um robert really took her he'd already joined the practice right. um in a management role and and um we he was promoted to a director to take on on that side of things and has taken things from strength to strength really and is there a, an overarching kind of managing director one person like a hierarchy of everyone who everyone answers to or is it much more no we have a we, we have a, a board um of directors and you know it's a it's a collegiate, collaborative um, group. How, how are decisions made typically? And, um, and well, we reach consensus. Right. Uh, in, in theory, we could have a vote, um, but I don't think we've ever had to have a, um, a vote. Um, so, yes, we have regular, uh, regular board meetings on, on different um, subjects. Um, and, and, and looking forward for the future of the practice, how do you identify future leaders um, to be kind of taking over the next kind of generation of succession yeah. of the practice. Because this is a, an interesting conversation for many um, larger practices and to be thinking about, and it's no quick process. No, it's a really interesting one. I, 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 I find it interesting. You, you keep on reading that um, some practices, you know, they've, they've, they've had all these in-depth discussions and they've they've suddenly discovered that the answer to succession is being an EOT, Employee Ownership Trust, uh, and now they've done succession. Or, or, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really work like that. You, you know, it's something you have to start thinking about from, well, perhaps not day one of the practice, but day two when, when, it, when the practice is up and running and mm -hmm. obviously has a future. I think really from right from the start, you have to start thinking about how you nurture people, how you support people, and how you bring them on to be the, the, the future leaders. So that's very much how we've, we've approached things. Um, and since, you know, since I've been in the practice, it's been a, a partnership, um, then a limited company, and it now is it's a, a hybrid EOT in that it's um, majority owned by an EOT, but it's also partly owned by the um, directors, which we think is a, I suppose, you know, coming back to this idea of the sort of creative tension within a practice, you know, all practices have to be really collaborative, 
we think. Yeah. And so we're trying very hard to foster the um, collaborative side of the practice and we see the um, EOT as representing and supporting that. But also you need to have clear leadership and, and direction. Of the two. So, so we thought this kind of hybrid model in a way um, reflected that. That's, that's interesting. So when did the, you, you move into the EOT model and what was the, the kind of impetus behind that? Um, I think it's about five years ago right. now, um, and it is partly to do with um, succession. Mm-hmm. Um, it's allowing people to develop their roles, but also uh, Alan and Paul, who are the founders, to you know develop their roles in a in a in a different way. Sort of focus on more specific things and allow others to take on um, you know some of the more you know f- full on roles of being a director of the practice. So Alan and Paul are still fully involved and are leading projects, but it gives them the freedom to think about the, the future, knowing that there's um, you know, there's a group of directors who are fully experienced and you know, have been with the practice for a long time to take things forward. And of course, we have to look at how you then bring up other people within the practice who yeah. are junior to us. So, so you're looking at, um, obviously, design, creativity, um, but also, you know, the ability to communicate, as I said before, you know, which comes down to win, winning work. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if we don't win work, we're not here as a practice. So, so that's a key aspect of, um, you know, what you're what you're looking for: the, the ability to engage with clients and future clients, um, and then to have that kind of level of conversation with them. What, what, in because it's an interesting question actually to, to look at when and what what does it take to be a director or a partner of a, a firm mm. and and many conversations I've had in with with founders of businesses they they often hear it's not for everybody mm. it's not it's not doesn't necessarily need to be the pinnacle of everybody's career to become the director though for a lot of people that, that is a, a main a main focus point for you what what are the sort of key things that you would be looking for from a, a new director or a new leader in the practice and if you're identifying people what what sorts of things do you often think actually we need to train them here's the skill sets that are missing that we often see hmm. i think it's the um it is that ability to communicate on a level that wins work coming hmm. back to what what architects are trained to do i think they're not trained enough to Talk to people. You know, yeah. Talk to people who aren't architects. <laughs> That's the you know they come out brilliant at talking to architects in a in a very particular architectural language, as I'm sure you're you know and yes. familiar with, and which no one else understands. <laughs> um, um, and also with the view that if they, which was certainly my view, that when I came out of um, college, that if you design stuff that's um, good enough. People are going to come to your your door and ask you to do more of it, and and of course that's that's not really the case. You have to work a lot harder at winning work than that. Mm-hmm. And the whole question about um, you know in, engaging with clients and um, is a is a key aspect of of what we look for um, in people to move to to move to the director level um, in terms Which, of projects. In in terms of winning. Work. You said already one one major strategy mm. of the practice is to uh, to be doing competitions. Mm. What are the, some of the other strategies, and what are some of the strategies that you'd be looking for? You know, potential directors to be involved in, or even current directors. What mm. sorts of what sorts of things that the directors have to do to make sure that works coming in outside of competitions? Well, I think it, it's well because because as a practice, if I put it. Put it back to our, where we started. We were doing. Yeah. We do a lot of very specific projects. So very often they're for clients who are only going to do one project, mm-hmm. and that's really really important to them. And um, hopefully we do it really really well. Um, but obviously that's there's no repeat in in, right. in, in that. So um, so I think what we, we've we've wised up to that to a certain extent that. Um, um, we do a lot of those kind of projects and we really enjoy them, but also actually, um, and partly because we invest so much in, in our relationships with those clients, it's, it's actually a, quite a sad thing when you finish the project and you think, well, that's over. You know? Yeah. Um, 
so I think these days we 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 spend a lot more time thinking about our ongoing relationships with with clients and and enjoying the process of working with them on repeating projects and um, and that's a key part of um, of what we do to maintain that dialogue and that relationship and you know look for other opportunities so, so kind of na- nurturing existing relationships yes. and looking for repeat work yes and yes. and do you ever kind of sit down as a as a director team and there's a sector that you haven't done work in like let's say sports stadium for example that's often one that practices want to do that's <laughs> di- difficult to get into do you, do you ever identify those sorts of opportunities and say and it like a it's, it, it's an active plan of okay we want to get we want to do those sorts of projects how do we get there who do we need to meet how do we is there a a, a kind of marketing team or a sales team almost or <laughs> or anything like that but we we do i'm just trying to think i mean what i suppose what what characterizes our projects is i think we're really looking for um i suppose ambitious clients because right. that's Clients who recognise that they need to go beyond the norm, mm-hmm. you know, because actually, what we, if we are specialists, we've become specialists in actually as a dealing with these these quite difficult, complex projects. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we, I think that all clients that should think they need to go beyond the norm because mm-hmm. no organisation can really, um, you know, sit on its laurels. Everything, you, everything has to be changed and sure. questioned, but. It's surprising how many projects still get procured with the idea of, um, you know, one one typical question on the selection um, uh, submission is, you know, um, demonstrate five similar projects that you've done in the past five years. Well, well, our view is if you've done five similar projects, you're, you're not going to bring bring you much fresh stale, thinking. Yeah. They, yes, it's a bit <laughs> like asking someone to serve up yesterday's cold dinner. Um, <laughs> You know, what we're trying to do is to bring and bring knowledge, bring experience, mm-hmm. but also from diverse different kinds of projects, and through that, the lateral thinking that that allows actually brings something fresh to the table that allows the architecture to move on and, and the organisation to actually develop something that is um, yeah, directed to their future evolution. And, and a lot of our project, our, our clients recognise that. So, so we that's where we tend to. We where are those kind of clients mm-hmm. coming from? So, a lot of our work, most of our work's in in the UK at the moment. But we um, we look for projects. We we will do ambitious projects wherever they are. And at the moment, we've got a couple of projects in France. Um, in the past, we've worked in Germany, Italy. Um, we're looking at opportunities in the United States at the moment, particularly within the university um, sector, you know, where we might be able to transfer some of the thinking from something like UCL Marshgate, right. um, but to projects with a different kind of ambition, but a similar level of ambition. So that's that's very much the focus of, of what we do. Um, in terms of different sectors, um, we do discuss them because obviously the industry is divided in, into into sectors, um, and I mean one of the things that we do is we try to make sure within each of the areas that we're working in we've always got at least one project on the go because you need to keep the thinking mm-hmm. alive um, all the time, right. and, and you need to have. You know, an example of something you've you've done recently in that particular area, because quite rightly, people aren't aren't going to um, they're not going to employ you if you don't have the knowledge. So this is that balance between not being stale and kind of having sufficient current. knowledge yeah. and being current. That's what that's what we try to do. Who, who whose responsibility is it with the fees to make sure that when you're negotiating the fees, the fees are set responsibly. So you're not kind of putting yourself and the rest of the practice into a difficult situation. How do you guys, what does that conversation look like and how is it, how is it managed? It's very laborious. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, um, we have the senior architects who are working on the project who will put together a resourcing plan. Right. Um, 
and um, um, and try to analyze that in mm -hmm. relation to what the project needs, but also in relation to other projects we've done in the past. But because a lot of our projects are quite unique and unusual, it's, it's very rarely, oh, yes, that's the same as this, and we can have a similar level of fee and resourcing. So they do that. Um, we do a certain amount of um, sort of research and sounding out about similar fees where, um, on other projects mm -hmm. elsewhere um, where that information is available. Um, and then Robert, who's, who's on the financial, who's the director responsible for our finances, oversees the whole process. And we make sure that at least two directors have signed off the, the fee right so that no one has got so enthusiastic <laughs> that they've been over something. ambitious yeah. and um because ultimately um we need to do the job properly mm -hmm. you know I, I think that's you know we want to give a very good level of service to our clients and so having it, too a fee that's too low and resourcing that's too low is 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 not to not to anyone's benefit. Well, it's it's so precarious in architecture that often you can find yourself in a situation where you're making a commitment mm. about the project, a commitment that's so important to the to the rest of the mm. next year and a half, two years, six years of the project, mm. at a point where you have the least amount of information on what it is that you're actually going to be doing. Do you ever, um, do, do you, when you're typically negotiating fees, is it for phases of work first and then you kind of there's a renegotiation periods where you go back to the client or is it you know much more like you know here's the fee here's the fee for the whole project all the way through how do you how do you kind of mitigate your own risk of making commitment too early on and then halfway through going actually the scope has expanded the client is way more problematic than we ever thought they were going to be we've gone round and round in circles here how how do you mitigate that that risk I mean, it's interesting, actually. It used to be the case that um, we would put in a fee for the whole um, project. Right. Um, and there was reasonable certainty that the whole project would run from beginning to end in mm. a reasonably uninterrupted way. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore in the current economic climate and probably in the past five or six years. I really sure. thought we're much more instructed on a stage-by-stage basis and I, I would say that that's it has some advantages um, except that you know we're always going to want to continue with the project and the opportunities to really renegotiate a, a fee are are limited I, I think mm -hmm. um, it's got a lot of challenges because in terms of a practice you know it, if you know that the project is you know what the fee is and, and you know it's going to continue for the next four years you can manage a practice much more easily than you can if you've got a team of 12 plus people on a project and you know they're doing this design stage but you actually don't know yet whether they're doing the next design stage and so whether you're going to need those 12 people and mm -hmm. the fee for that project is going to come in so I think you know although in theory there might be some benefit to stage by stage uh, in practice it makes actually running the finances and resources. Much easier. The no, yeah. I think it's more difficult because you don't have the long-term plan. No, yeah, so it's much easier with a longer, with yes. a long, with, yeah. when you're committed for a long term. Cause, yes. No, I mean, I've, we've, I've definitely seen that with, you know, just from a small, small practice, there's a, a, a big <coughs> shift that happens when you've got, maybe, you know, a handful of clients that are mm. going to be with you for more than a year mm. and you know that they're locked in and it's committed and there's, mm. work, there's money coming in each month. Like yes. business, everyone can kind of... Breathe a little bit and mm. start to plan and and develop your your resources. Um, so interesting. So the senior architects are quite involved in actually putting together a resourcing plan yes, yeah. for the fees. Mm. How involved are they then as the project moves along and um, as you're working on it in making sure that, that that the profit margin that you set at the beginning is being honoured? Do they have the kind of the financial information to look they, at that? They, they, they do. So the projects are set up with. A director or sometimes two directors mm -hmm. leading them but we usually have um, a senior associate who is in a project leader role mm -hmm. and they and they take on so I mean obviously it depends on the complexity of the project and size of the project but they take on a role that 
part of which is making sure that it, um, the resourcing and fees align with the expectations. And so they have all of that, um, that knowledge. And then I think that's um, the team. We try to keep the, the project team aware of how the project is, is doing, um, but without worrying them too much with too much. It's, it's a balance as, as to whether you alarm people with the, 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 the detail or, or, <laughs> or, or, or not. Yeah, well, yeah, and you also don't want people to, you know, we do have projects that are um, quite profitable and we have projects that actually don't make a profit. And we don't want the people who are on the projects which aren't making a profit to feel somehow this is their fault. Less because important. very often it's, you know, the project's very important. It's just a really difficult project to get to stack mm-hmm. up. Um, and well, it's, it's, it's interesting because there's a level of responsibility when being transparent, and mm. in in general, you know, transparency around finances and practice, I think, is very important. And but you know, as you get larger, there is a responsibility in the person who's listening to the information and understanding what's happening on the practice. And you know, you know, to suddenly tell everyone that the project is unprofitable can be very demoralizing. Yes, and yeah. and upsetting, and kind of cause fear and uncertainty where they didn't need to be. No, absolutely. And it's the same on the practice level. It's getting the balance right between, you know, letting people know how, how the practice is doing and, and hopefully encouraging everyone to to work efficiently and be profitable because ultimately that will feed back um, financially to, to everyone. Equally, when things are difficult, I think it's important to share some of that, mm-hmm. but not to the point where you demoralize or worry people because actually you have to have quite a deep understanding of the financial um, issues in, in order to really know, you know where, where the problems are or not. So it, it's always finding the right level of information to share. Do you ever experience issues with your clients having their own financial problems and them perhaps withholding payments or being slow to pay on things or those kinds of those like those sorts of things certainly on larger projects can be very you know disorientating or debilitating for a, for a practice when when the client starts mm. to get into trouble certainly yeah. you know since over covid and um, you know, the last few years have been quite precarious in many senses or clients have been hesitant as well to move forward for, with, with projects Hmm. Have, you, have you seen any of that and how do you manage it? It's difficult to manage that. I mean, we're, we're fortunate. We, um, our clients are, are very good at um, paying. <laughs> so, you know, they, well, we, and we, you know, we monitor it very carefully because, yeah. um, you know, if you issue an invoice and it's not paid for a period of, of you know, beyond the period when it's supposed to be paid by, then you, you need to keep an, uh, an eye on that. So we... We look at that every week as, as to, to how that works. So we, we've been fortunate and we haven't historically had a, a, a problem with um, you know, late payment or, or this kind of thing. But it does, it does happen. Mm-hmm. Um, um, sometimes because clients are having financial difficulties, as, as you say, and sometimes because we work with big institutions, sometimes the, the, the mechanisms of the bureaucracy some, uh, uh, there's some grit in the machine and and, and you know, something goes wrong and, and it, you know, the, the payments don't happen as they're supposed to happen. But um, in, in general, we've been reasonably do, do you, when you're liaising with the client, and particularly perhaps a client you haven't worked with mm-hmm. before, how do you do your due diligence on them to make sure that they've, you know, basically they're, they're, they are what they say they are and they've got the, they've got a healthy finance to be able to engage with the project that has their ambition we we I am trying to think because most of most of our clients are um, you know when we work for someone like UCL we hope that they are it's a it's a well respected brand, well respected brand. Yeah. And, and I think that probably is is the case of, of for most of our clients um, if we're approached by someone we we don't know um, and, and, and there's not much information about them we 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 try to find. Um, other people who might have worked with them and, and um, do a little bit of um, diligence in, in that respect and look and see what's available on Company House. 
and um, in terms of accounts and things like this. So we do, we, we do, do um, research and we want to know what our, the, the clients are doing too in terms of other issues like you know, sustainability and, and, mm. um, and the ambition for their, their projects. You know. um, so um, we'll, we'll look to see what kind of our, uh, schemes they're developing um, partly just to see, you know, is there a, is there a join up between the kind of thing that they're doing and the kind of thing that we are um, good at doing? Because if there isn't, you know, yeah, we, we have to be able to give value to them and, and there has to be that kind of um, join up of vision or it's not, it's not going to work out. So, yeah. Brilliant. So what's in store for the rest of uh, 2024? Oh, well, um, well, we've got a lot of, um, quite interesting work um, on the go within the practice. Um, I mean, we were talking earlier about long-term projects and um, actually the same the same week that we won the UCL project, um, we also won the project for the Museum of London, so um, which is the largest project within the, the practice. Um, um, so that was 2016. Is that the site up in Clerkenwell? It's the uh, Smithfield. Smithfield, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. So we won it in 2016, and the first phase opens in 2026. Um, and it's, it's a collaboration with that, but there's a quite a yes, large design team. Yeah, yeah, no, it's an interesting project. It's a very large project. Um, so we're working with Asif Khan, yep. um, and we're also working with Julian Harrop on the conservation side. So it's very much a, a collaboration. Um, and it's it's a remarkable scheme. I mean, it's, it's one of... Um, Europe's largest cultural projects at the moment, um, and you know we were talking about ambitious clients. You mm-hmm. know, this is, a project like this, it's not about we've got these number of artifacts, these number of visitors, you know, a sort of functional brief. It's very much about reimagining what the twenty first century museum is and mm-hmm. how it's engaged with its. Um, with the surrounding city, which of course particularly relevant for uh, the Museum of London. Yeah. Um, you know, is it a twenty-four hour museum? How can it be a museum about the future as well as the past? You know, making it more of a public forum, engaging different audiences. So these are the kind of questions that actually um, we find actually go across quite a few of the projects. So UCL is not that different. You know, how does mm. the university engage with the surrounding context? reach out to the surrounding community. Um, the building allows the community into it. It's got public uses within it. A lot of these kind of themes are across our projects. Um, so, um, so I was diverging from, but, but I think that, that is a sort of interesting example of, of, the, of the way a cultural project, a university project can tackle similar sort, yeah. of, sort of things. Um, so that's very exciting that that's um, ongoing. Um, we're working on a number of quite large life science schemes. Um, and again, they are, um, they're not about, we're well, going to put a box in a science park somewhere. They're much more complex than that. Mm-hmm. So we've been doing a, um, um, a very advanced pharmaceutical manufacturing building, the kind of thing that would be a box in a park usually but we're putting it in the middle of Stevenage and a high-rise building so it's accessible by public transport it's got public realm associated with it it's despite the fact these are clean rooms and they're the most isolated environments you could imagine mm-hmm. they've got shops and retail below them um, so it's kind of reimagining what that kind of facility could could be and, and we're doing other projects um, in that kind of area of work in Cambridge, where again it's you know it's not out of town, it's in town, you know, it's accessible by public transport, it's got active public frontages. It's a kind of mixed use um, building. Yeah. And I think you know, we were talking about specialisms mm-hmm. earlier. Um, you, you could say most a lot of the projects are are hybrid. In fact, that's that's one of the reasons why not being too specialist yeah. is so important. Well, yeah. I, I think it's interesting that you start to make the distinction. Actually, if there was a specialism, it's it's dealing with complexity yeah. and actually dealing with complex clients, mm. which a lot of people, a lot of I'm sure mm. a lot of clients can actually see themselves in those kinds of mm. organisations. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's it, and 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 the complexity of something like. Um, 
UCL Marsh Gag. You know, this big mix. Yeah. This big mix is kind of what it's all about. I mean, I think, you know, I think about, you know, we're in London, you know, why do people live here? It, it's, it's proximity, it's sort of density, it's diversity. And that all feeds into the creativity of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, and when we're designing UCL, you know, we're trying to, in fact, do that in a microcosm within the building. Um, um, I suppose when, in practice, you're trying to also do that. Diverse minds, diverse people feeding into creativity. Um, but increasingly, the projects also do have an element of that diversity. You know, we, we've moved well beyond zoning of cities into different functional components. Yeah. You know, I think now, fortunately, you know, if you look at the debate about innovation districts and things, in a way, it's like reinventing the traditional city again. It's not actually that new. It's, you know, can you live, work, have all these different things happening creatively juxtaposed? Um, and the projects are very much like that, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a, you know, a hugely exciting aspect of, of what we're doing. Brilliant. Uh, it's the perfect place to conclude the conversation. Gavin, thank you okay. so much for um, sharing your expertise and a bit about your career and, and what you guys are up to at Staten Williams. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.